TGIF Cubs fans, it's Friday and there's a day game today at 120, which is music to our ears as Cubs fans. Yesterday, the Cubs had the day off, but could they be getting a little boost to the bullpen sometime soon as Ethan Roberts has been pitching really well in AAA? Ian Happ, Dansby Swanson, Michael Bush, all heating up at the plate. What could that mean for this lineup as the Cubs try to go on a winning streak today against the Mets? That and more on this edition of the Cubs Baseball Channel. Make sure to like and subscribe. Get in the comments section. Let us know how you're feeling about the Cubs as they enter this weekend series against the New York Mets. Here is your invitation to our show. What do you say, Cubs fans? Welcome to the Cubs Baseball Channel. My name is Anthony Pasquale for the Cubs Baseball Channel. As we welcome you in, I'm on Twitter at Ant underscore Pasquale3. Make sure to follow me on there. It's where I give some Cubs trivia, some Cubs hot takes or warm takes, whatever you want to call them, about this team as they operate through a season that's been pretty frustrating but could be on the up and up if the Cubs continue to hit the way they did in that series against the Giants. Of course, we mentioned this yesterday. That was their first three-game series win since May 10th to the 12th against the Pittsburgh Pirates. And now they welcome the Mets into town looking to stay on the winning path and head into a pretty tricky end of June and early July schedule that features the Brewers and the Phillies and also the Orioles before the uh, All-Star break coming up in mid-July. But that's all looking ahead. Today, the Cubs take on the New York Mets at 120, which we know is always the best time to watch a Cubs baseball game on a Friday. They'll be the only game on and great because the Cubs have their ace Mike Imanaga the second on the mound. He's seven and one on the season with a 1.89 ERA. He's up against former Cub, potentially the headliner in one of the worst trades in Cubs history. Jose Quintana two and five on the season with a 4.98 ERA. An interesting note here for Imanaga. Uh, this is going to be the first team that he is going to face for a second time. Um, he has faced every team that he's faced so far in his 13 starts once. Uh, the Mets are going to be the first team that's getting another look at him. So we're going to get our first really good chance to see just how truly dominant this guy is because if a team has seen him once before, how are they going to do a second time around? Now, the Mets did not fare very well against him the first time. I think only Jeff McNeil um, put together a solid game. I think he went two for three against Imanaga. The rest of their lineup, for the most part, was hitless. So um, he pitched really well against the Mets, which he has pitched really well against pretty much every team, with the exception of that one outing against the Brewers and then one okay outing against the Braves. But the rest of the outings have been unbelievable from Imanaga. I think he's firmly... Uh, the number one in the NL Rookie of the Year race. Um, the, the only contender that really worries me is Paul Skeens. If he continues what he's doing at, at the level that he's doing, I guess potentially he could leap Shota. Um, but Shota seems to be number one. And, and he's also firmly in that Cy Young race. I, I know there's some Ranger Suarez, Tyler Glass now, Zach Wheeler. Um, but I think his name is deservedly so right up there with, and I think I had above those guys, if you had to ask me, um, but you see here at the bottom of your screen, it says Mike Imanaga. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this, uh, story. I'm sure you have been developing over the last couple of weeks. Um, we know that Shota, the only time he really leaves his house to go get his Dunkin' coffee. And I guess, uh, saying Shota for the pickup or putting in Shota on the app, whatever it is that he's doing felt like too much work and was too difficult for the Duncan employees. So instead he goes with Mike, Mike Imanaga, the second, and they asked him why the second. And he said, that just looks cool. So <laughs> the character and, and the icon of Shota Imanaga continues to grow, but we're going to stick with Mike Imanaga, the second right now for today's probables. He's going for the Cubs looking to make it a three game winning streak. Their first in quite some time up against a former Cub, uh, which leads me to think, our first question to the comment section, um, was that the worst Cubs trade of all time? I know there's some obviously recency bias there, and I, I think a lot of you might jump in really quick and just say the Jose Quas one. Um, but 
let me know if you guys think that is the uh, the worst Cubs trade of all time. But there's an, another interesting aspect to this game against the Mets today. Grimace against Shota. Now, ever since Grimace threw out the first pitch, and for those of you who don't know who Grimace is, he's the big purple like mascot looking scary monster thing that from McDonald's. And for whatever reason, he threw out the first pitch at City Field last week. Um, and the Mets went on a seven game winning streak after he threw out that first pitch. They did lose two days ago. So they're seven and one since Grimace threw out the first pitch. Um, the Cubs in 13 Shota Imanaga starts are 11 and two. So something's got to give Grimace versus Shota. Let me know in the comment section who you guys are taking. But that is uh, the storyline beneath the storyline for today's ball game. But let's get into a little bit of uh, some hot streaks. Ian Happ. Uh, carrying the Cubs offense for about a, two weeks now. Ever since he was benched, he, he's just been unbelievable in this Cubs lineup. And these we've talked about it. He's got peaks and he's got valleys. And the valleys are extremely rough, but the peaks are extremely high. And you get to benefit off of that. Um, and like Mick has said countless times on this show, Mick obviously can't be on this show. He's actually at that game in Birmingham between the Giants and the Cardinals. He's in Birmingham for the series um, as they honor Willie Mays, of course, and do um, a lot of Negro Leagues um, festivities and honors there. So um, I hope he enjoys it. We were texting and it seems like he's having a great time there. But Mick has always said about Ian Happ, the reason why the Cubs are so high on him is because he's the type of guy that can carry your offense um, through – tough stretches. It kind of reminds me of uh, Alfonso Soriano, the type of hot streaks that he used to go on in Chicago, where he would just put the team on his back for two to three weeks and then maybe cool off a little bit, hit a few homers, and then put the team on his back for like two to three weeks. And that's what Ian Happ is doing right now. He's been sensational and the biggest plus uh, for a Cubs team that needed some more power He's brought it. He's hitting homers now. He's hitting doubles, gap to gap power from the right, from the left. It's been really awesome to see out of Ian Happ. We also talked about Dansby Swanson getting back into the home run column. He's been seeing the ball really well and taking it the other way, hitting it hard, which is a great sign for him. But there's one guy that I want to talk about that I feel like isn't getting enough attention. It's Michael Bush. And I think he was maybe a little bit motivated by a lot of the rumors saying the Cubs are going to be targeting um, – some power hitting first baseman, And he just wanted to remind you guys that, Hey, I can hit. And he's been great over the last two weeks, but you know, you hear Vladimir Guerrero jr. And you hear Pete Alonzo, these big first baseman prowess power type hitting type of guys. Um, and Michael Bush, isn't that he's not going to give you 40 homers a year, like Alonzo or Guerrero jr. But um, he hopes to develop into a better glove and a better contact bat, at least than Alonzo, and hopefully on the same scale as Guerrero Jr. But if you look at the war of first baseman in the league, I saw a tweet about this. I don't remember who tweeted it, so I can't give proper credit. But Michael Bush actually has a better war, wins above replacement this season, than both Alonzo and Guerrero. So technically, obviously name value and uh, the value that they bring to your lineup is, is not in war. But um, technically on paper, if the Cubs were to go get one of these two guys and put them at first base, they'd technically be downgrading from Michael Bush and the year that he's had. So I want to give him kudos, especially over the last seven games. Uh, the last seven games, Michael Bush is 10 for 23, sitting 435 and slugging 652. He's got a homer. He's got three runs driven in, three walks. He's been really good. But if you go back the last 15 games, it's still going on. He's hitting 366. And you could say, oh, it's just a little bit of a hot streak. No, if you go back 30 games, he's hitting 297, about 300 for the last month. That's good. That's exactly what you want out of this guy. Ever since that series in Milwaukee, Michael Bush has been fantastic. And he went through a big slump after that uh, nice stretch of power in April. Uh, he went through a stretch where it seemed like he wasn't ready to hit major league pitching, but then he really adjusted. He had a two hit game in Milwaukee on May 28th. And since then he has just been locked in at the plate. He's currently on a, let me count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight game hitting streak heading into the series against the Mets. Um, even if the power is not there, the fact that he's setting the table and driving the ball gap to gap doubles, that's a great sign out of Michael Bush. And I'm interested to see how Craig council, kind of contours this lineup because you've got a red hot Ian Happ, 
a red hot Michael Bush and Dansby Swanson, who's heating up. But for the last few games, Hap Swanson and Bush have been five, seven, eight, or five, six, seven, um, with Nico Horner either six or jumping up to that leadoff spot. So it's going to be interesting. Like Christopher Morell, not only over the last month has been terrible, but he's hitting below 200 on the season. So when do you think about maybe moving him out of the the cleanup spot and going maybe um, Horner, Hap, Bellinger, Bush? Like, what about that? What about Horner, Hap, Bellinger, Bush? Then maybe you do, say, a five, Morel six, like something like that. Just experiment with it. Try to get something that really clicks because these guys are hot right now. And you know what you always say? You want your best hitters to get the most at bats. And right now I want Ian Hap and I want Michael Bush at the plate as much as possible. Talked a little bit about this uh, pretty much in every episode that we'll ever do because this Cubs bullpen is terrible. Um, the bullpen woes continue, obviously, as they gave up four runs against the Giants uh, two days ago and hopefully don't yield a bunch of runs up against the Mets this series. But I want to talk about Ethan Roberts, who the Cubs obviously designated Jose Quas for assignment in order to keep Ethan Roberts on the 40-man roster um, he's got a zero ERA in 13 games since returning from his injury, including unbelievable statistics in AAA, which means he's a step away from being in the big leagues. I don't think it'll become super soon because the Cubs want to make sure he's healthy enough to get back to big league action. But this is a dark horse as a guy that can really help your bullpen as you move forward. Um, I think the Cubs will also get Keegan Thompson off the paternity list very soon, which will probably mean – Porter Hodge sent back down to the minor leagues. Um, Jorge Lopez, the former Met, uh, I thought maybe they'd be trying to get him up and ready for this series against New York. Haven't heard too much about him and his debut so far in the minor leagues, but he's a name to keep an eye on as well um, as the Cubs will continue to look for upgrades over the next month or so. Um, but here's another guy, former Met, that I want to give a report on. Thomas Nito, the catcher that the Cubs signed Um when they designated Jan Gomes for assignment, obviously Gomes meant a lot to this team and was a huge part of their success last year, but the success that he was a part of last year, he was as big a reason for that as he has been for the struggles this year. Um, and, and Gomes has had a great career and he was a, a Cub fan favorite, um, but he just didn't have it this year. He was hitting really poorly at the plate, fielding worse than he ever has. No arm, uh, only caught three runners stealing and, and, other teams knew that, and they were taking the extra base on the Cubs quite often. Um, it's not that Miguel Amaya has been much better, but he's younger, and the Cubs have some faith in his ability to improve, whereas Gomes, they worry this might be the end of the road. So they go out and sign Nito, who was DFA'd by the Mets not too long ago. Uh, he's not hitting great this year, um, but he's hitting better than Jan Gomes was, and he feels much better. He's caught six runners stealing and limited action against uh, – on the Mets, I should say. Um, and he's a guy the Cubs will be looking to, to just be a, a solid backup, not looking for too much more. He's hitting 229 on the season, not great. He's hit three homers. Again, like it's in the middle of June and the catching position is so hard to find. You're not going to go and get a star off waivers in June, but it's an upgrade from what the Cubs had. And at the very least, that's a good thing. Uh, the other big story, Moises Bell Ballesteros, absolutely crushing the ball since his call up to triple a he is hitting 500 he's got a homer he's got a double he's got a caught stealing showing off the cannon um he's a guy that is on the rise in every prospect rankings especially within the cubs system um mick has already voiced some of his concerns he's not great behind the plate not a great uh glove work uh, in terms of framing but he's got a cannon of an arm, and boy, can he hit. The bat-to-ball skills will play at any level, including the big leagues. Um, so he's a guy where maybe you know, you're know you okay with suffering a little bit on the defensive end because you know you're going to get it on the offensive end. That's kind of the trade-off with him, um, whereas currently with Gomes and Amaya and potentially Nito, you're not getting great defense or great offense. And at least Ballesteros can get you great offense while you suffer some of the defense, but hopefully in AAA, he kind of figures out catching a little bit. He's going to be working with the coaches down there a lot to improve uh, defensively. And the Cubs are hoping to get his bat into the big league lineup as soon as possible. Um, our final thing here is a little bit of a trivia question for you, which non cub has the most home runs in Wrigley Field history, which non-cub 
has the most home runs in Wrigley Field history? That is your trivia question of the day. Make sure to get in the comment section. Drop your answer to that. Drop your answer to if you think Shota Imanaga and his prowess will excel over Grimace and the hot Mets who are streaking at the right time for New York. Let us know also when you think Ballesteros could be coming to the major leagues. But thank you guys so much for tuning into the Cubs baseball channel. Make sure to like and subscribe. Ring the bell. And once again, thank you guys so much for joining us. We'll be back, hopefully, to recap a Cubs W and sing Go Cubs Go for Shota Imanaga's eighth win of the season. Mike Imanaga, I should say.